Hey, thanks for joining me. Hope you're doing well. There is a firmament or dome encasing our flat plane. The firmament is described in the Bible's creation narrative. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. In Egyptian mythology, Newt is the goddess of the sky. She is seen star covered, arching over the earth, representing its dome. In Greek mythology, Uranus was the primeval god of the sky. The Greeks imagined the sky as a solid dome of brass, whose edges descended to rest upon the outermost limits of the flat earth. Uranus was the literal sky, and Gaia the earth. In the Roman era, he was often depicted as Eon, god of eternal time, in the form of a man holding the zodiac wheel, standing above Gaia. The Hebrews believed the sky was a solid dome. They called this solid vault of heaven the Rakia, with the sun, moon, and stars beneath. In Indian mythology, the dome is called Brahmanda. This is the structure of the world according to Finnish mythology, showing a dome with the stars projected onto it. In the aboriginal conception of the world, the earth was circular and flat, covered by the dome of the sky, which stretched out to the horizon. And there have been many ancient artifacts found, which the mainstream has called stone handbags. But as you can see, there's no area to even carry anything. These were not handbags. They're artistic depictions of the dome here on flat earth. So many ancient peoples knew about this dome and wove it into their worldview. The elite would have us believe that these are just made up cosmologies invented by peoples who were too scientifically ignorant to understand reality. But there is no coincidence that the same description of a flat earth and dome is so common. These cultures around the world had special knowledge about the nature of this place we are living in. The dome is connected to catastrophes that have been recorded throughout the ages. What modern society calls myths and legends are in fact ancient history, and woven into various myths are descriptions of devastating celestial events. In ancient times, something very awful happened, the Great Flood sometimes called the deluge. It was so devastating and frightening that it remained in all of humanity's ancient written and oral traditions. It's possible that these stories over time have been transformed from true descriptions into mythology, where the celestial bodies are given names and human-like characteristics, and in this way, everything was hidden in plain sight. Almost every culture around the world has a great flood in the pages of their mythology, including the Incas, Mayans, Polynesians, Egyptians, Hopis, Aztecs, Germans, Greeks, Aboriginals, Indians, Vikings, Chinese, Sumerians, all around the world. Is this why the ancients were obsessed with tracking the movement of the stars? Were they trying to predict when another one of these catastrophes would happen? The foreign celestial body that caused destruction has been known as Typhon in the Roman Empire, Frightener in the Celtic nations, Shiva in India, and Angra Manu in the Persian Empire. Here we see the Milky Way's Great Rift. The definition of rift is a crack, split, or break in something. The Great Rift we see when we look at the sky is not a series of dust clouds like the liars at NASA would have us believe, but a literal crack in the dome. The Mayans called this the Dark Rift before any scientist had named it the Great Rift. The Bible refers to this crack as the windows of heaven. It was through these windows, through the dark rift, that the waters of the great floods fell. In Norse mythology, we find that at Ragnarok, the sky splits in two. From the split, the sons of Muspel ride forth. In the Babylonian creation epic, the sky is made from the body of Tiamat the goddess of watery chaos. The god Marduk splits her like a shellfish into two parts, posting guards as to not let her waters escape. The aboriginal people saw the dark rift as the area where a dangerous creature known as Yura lives. Among American Indians, the sky was also conceived of as a solid dome which would break in cycles. As Lucien Levy Brule wrote, in North America, in Indian belief, the earth is a circular disk usually surrounded on all sides by water and the sky is a solid concave hemisphere coming down at the horizon to the level of the earth. In Cherokee and other Indian myths, the sky is continually lifting up and coming down again to the earth, like the upper blade of a pair of scissors. Over the years, much evidence has come forth that a worldwide flood happened 5,000 to 7,000 years ago, the same time period many Christians point to as when the Great Flood occurred. 
There's also evidence that a worldwide flood occurred as recent as the 1800s. These are photos you rarely see, ancient structures covered in mud and many destroyed, but they have since been dug up and refurbished. Many ancient sites we know and love are not the originals. They were buried and rebuilt in the late 1800s through the early 1900s. We could excuse the destruction of some of these ancient sites if they were one area or continent, but we see the same all throughout the world. Mexico, Egypt, Greece, Russia. The elite rebuilt these structures for us because they don't want us to know about the destruction that took place sometime in the 1800s. A great flood coming from the sky would mean they could not impose a heliocentric worldview on us, since the dome and waters above obviously don't fit into a globe model. And simple weather patterns could never explain a worldwide flood. History is easily hidden when the general populace isn't writing it. Might Earth constantly be in a state of destruction and renewal? Are these floods happening more and more? I'm suggesting that these floods are cyclical. The sun, moon, planets, and constellations somehow dictate this reset clock mechanism of the flat earth. This is one reason why the ancients were always watching the skies with so much dedication, for signs of another catastrophe. Sadly, the information of this reset mechanism has been hidden and kept to the controllers of this world. There is perhaps a total reset every 5,000 years. There is some device sitting above this crack, perhaps the celestial destroyer that so many texts talk about. The light we see at the center of the Milky Way is emanating from this device. And this thing, this entity if we are to call it that, enters in the dark rift, sending down floodwaters from above. It then seals itself back above the rift until the next cycle of destruction. Perhaps the elite have discovered a way to control these floods, and this celestial destroyer is simply a man-made mechanism or an entity that can be unlocked, enticed, or reprogrammed to send down floodwaters at will. My friend Chris Seeley has suggested that the pyramids and similar structures around the world have had the ability in the past to manipulate and control these floods. And I quote, because when temples are built on ley line nodal points, they can and possibly were connected in resonance and capacitance with the illuminates and subsequent toroid field, thereby initiating the fracturing of the dome above the flat earth, allowing in the waters above causing great floods, and a complete electrical shorting of the temples, which would explain the evidence of the electrically fried and disintegrated stone obelisks found at or near many temple sites now. In my video on menstrual blood, I gave my own rough explanation for the Great Flood. At this point, we can only speculate. What we can be sure of, however, is that there is a dome above us, and these floods come from the crack we see in the dark rift. The reality of the dome and cyclical destruction is hidden in plain sight. Rainbows prove that we're living under a dome. Anybody can create a rainbow outside with sufficient sunlight and water. However, a mirror is required to create a rainbow inside, and not just a mirror, but one that is submerged in water. If a rainbow is caused by reflection, refraction, and dispersion of light in water droplets, resulting in a spectrum of light, then why would you need a mirror inside? After all, you can easily have dispersion of light in water droplets indoors. It's because rainbows require a mirror, and outside, the dome is acting as this mirror. Like the protocol for making indoor rainbows, our flat earth has waters above, the waters which come down during the floods, and water on its surface. 
the dome acts as the mirror in between. Modern science says that in a rainbow, direct sunlight comes into a rain droplet, and then it comes out looking like the visible spectrum. Each water droplet acts as its own lens. But if this were the case, each water droplet in a rainbow would contain all the colors of the visible spectrum, resulting in a hodgepodge of colors throughout, and not the gradual spectrum we see. When we zoom in, each droplet of a rainbow has its own specific color. This only makes sense if the visible spectrum is being reflected off of a type of mirror, a dome, and then spreading onto the waters of a rainbow, the dome triangulating the sunlight. The flat earth dome is fastened to the outer limits of the Antarctica ice wall that surrounds our plane. In 1947, during Operation High Jump, Admiral Byrd discovered the outer boundaries of the firmament. Many of his men's planes were disappearing very quickly. A lot of them were crashing into invisible barriers and disintegrating in mid-flight. It was shortly after discovering this barrier that Byrd discontinued his mission and returned home. What happened is Byrd's planes encountered the walls of the vaulted dome. Soon after, many measures like the Antarctica Treaty and a consistent military presence at the ice wall were put in place to cover up the structure of our enclosed world system, while also preventing unwarranted intrusion which could lead to an announcement of the discovery of the Earth's dome. Here are some photos of the ice wall which the dome is fastened to. Sadly, we don't have as many as we would like since this area is heavily protected by military presence. So if there is a dome, how are meteorites explained? Debris floats around in the currents of the waters above the dome, occasionally hitting the barrier with enough force to penetrate it. This debris falls to the earth as meteorites. The composition of meteorites is very similar to that of the rocks and crust found on the ocean floor. Most of the ocean floor is basalt. Basalt contains primarily pyroxene, plagioglass, and oftentimes olivine. And the most abundant minerals in meteorites are pyroxene, plagioglass, and olivine. I'm therefore proposing that the waters above have a similar basalt that is found on our own ocean floors, and that these chunks from time to time hit our flat plain. It's been suggested that Libyan desert glass, mysterious shards of a glass-like material which, according to the scientists, has an unknown origin, are pieces of the dome that have been shed. Libyan desert glass is unlike any other glass. It is a form of molten glass but has no clear layers of other minerals. It is 98% molten silica. It has an extremely high formation temperature of 3092 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's extremely resilient, like any dome above us would be. Perhaps this is the molten glass described in the Bible's book of Job. Hast thou stretched out the heavens, which are strong, and as a molten glass? Every photo and video given to us by NASA is completely faked and riddled with CGI. Here we see a supposed video feed of Earth. Where are all the satellites? Along with 2,271 satellites orbiting the Earth, there are 500,000 fragments of space junk, and we're supposed to believe that in all of the feeds they give us, we are constantly, conveniently witnessing portions of the Earth without any of these man-made obstructions? This is absolutely bullshit. We now have satellite phones. Now we can have perfect service anywhere because the signals are being beamed from outer space. How convenient, right? Wrong. Satellites do not exist. Most of us notice as soon as we're out of the city and in more remote areas, our satellite cell service starts to decline in intensity. It's almost as if our phones are getting their signals from ground technology that is conglomerated in heavily populated areas. We also see problems with GPS in remote areas, supposedly a technology that also uses satellites. Long-range navigation was developed during World War II. Towers like these were positioned to provide coverage for military navigation. Positioned on islands, they would provide the necessary contact points for propagation at sea. This was the beginning of these land-based technologies that have grown and become more widespread. Cell towers are responsible for much of our GPS. By measuring the signal strength differences between multiple cell towers, your device can estimate your current location. Data is also propagated through undersea cables. Cables connect between the continents. 
lighter than air vehicles, high altitude airships, and high altitude platforms are often misperceived as satellites by the public. So at nighttime, when you see one of those moving dots in the sky and believe it to be a satellite, it's actually one of these illuminated balloons. The skies are riddled with these communications technologies, but we are made to believe that they exist beyond our atmosphere. If we are to believe NASA's stories, then here's a question. How do satellites survive the 4,000 degree Fahrenheit temperature in space? There are only seven elements on the periodic table that could withstand this heat, and none of them have been used for satellites. Satellites allegedly reside in the thermosphere, where temperatures can soar 4,000 degrees and more. This is simply not possible. These technologies are in flight underneath our dome. Including the technologies I just named, there are at least 18 platforms that can be used independently, in tandem, or in groups to provide all of the services that satellites supposedly provide. With new eyes, it becomes clear. No actual photos, no actual video footage, just CGI and photoshopped images. This is a NASA photo of an astronaut fixing the supposed space station. I'm completely joking. This is actually from the 2013 movie Gravity. This is a real NASA photo. They're almost indistinguishable. I actually think the Gravity photo looks more believable. The similar Hebrew word nasha means to lead astray, to delude, to morally seduce. It's then no wonder that the NASA logo contains a serpent's tongue, serpents having been a symbol for deception throughout mythology. On the gravestone of Werner von Braun, one of NASA's early rocket developers, there is a reference to a Bible verse that talks about our dome, our firmament. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheath his handiwork. I've discussed in previous videos how the sun is the collective consciousness of the whole, showering down on us in tandem with the astrolite and black sun. Our auras contain the information of our individual energetic vibrations. Our auras are literally made of sunlight, and the sun is literally the sum of our auras. This is revealed within the word aura. AU is the periodic table's abbreviation for gold, and Ra is the Egyptian personification of the sun. The sun is the sum of the colors of our auras mixed together, which appears to our eyes as white. White light refracted in a prism shows all the colors of the visible light spectrum. These seven colors are also the seven color variations of our auras. We are the sun. The moon, however, is different. It has been tampered with. In my video on menstrual blood, I describe how the moon was not always in the sky, suggesting it's an implant initially foreign to our flat plane. It sends down rigid square waves at us via the Saturn moon matrix and creates an interdimensional light trap which attempts to recycle us back into another incarnation. So we remain energetic food for the parasitic forces of this world that feed off of fear and suffering, the very emotions this false matrix we're living in aims to extract. The sun and moon are each about only 3,000 miles away, sitting well underneath the dome. What about the stars? Stars are clearly not suns. They are not bright and luminous like we have been sold, but twinkling energies of light that continuously change in color, texture, and shape. <laughs> Sonoluminescence is the emission of short bursts of light from imploding bubbles in a liquid when excited by sound. To put in simple terms, the energy of a sound wave in a fluid can create flashes of light. Due to sound frequencies, beautiful patterns occur on the surface of an object closely surrounding the sound vibrating medium. Cymatics is vibrational phenomenon, beautiful patterns that are created within water and sand when sound is applied. 
the stars are full of similar geometric patterns. These sound frequencies are carried through the astral light, which shoots out of the center of our plane. The other side of our plane, Agartha, is so harmonious that these frequencies created there, whether it be actual sound or just waves of natural harmonious tones, appear as beautiful lights in our skies, revolving us and giving us spiritual guidance in the form of astrology. So waves that create the stars are caused by frequencies from the other side of our flat plane. These sound waves propagate through the dome and the waters above, where they reflect back as twinkling sonoluminescent lights that we call stars. And we can zero in and see. It looks like these lights are indeed reflecting off water, in a similar fashion that they would on the floor of a pool or ocean. With just a telescope in our backyards, we can see that planets are not as defined as NASA would have us believe. In fact, Venus looks more like a star than a planet, and same with Mars. I'm still figuring out what exactly planets are, but for now we can assume they are created similarly by sonoluminescence. Planets do not twinkle like stars, giving me the impression that they are stronger, more consistent monotone frequencies, therefore appearing more solidified than a star, which represents consistent but oscillating frequencies. This may be the reason why planets do not twinkle and stars do. The planets have a strong spiritual influence on this plane as seen in astrology. They are a monumental part of the guiding forces on Earth, and therefore are somehow intact in ways the stars are not. One thing we can observe is that stars and planets look identical in distance in the sky, and this is because they're not various distances away but expressions of sound carried by the astral light and reflecting onto our dome. We've been taught that Earth is spinning, with its surface at the equator moving at a speed of a thousand miles per hour. Earth is also zooming around the sun at around 67,000 miles per hour. In addition, our solar system whirls around the center of our galaxy at some 490,000 miles per hour. You've never felt a thing on this motionless plane, but besides that, We've been seeing the same constellations and stars in the skies for thousands of years. This is because the stars are revolving year after year in the same positions around us. It's amazing how most of humanity is fooled into thinking the opposite, even while our senses tell us otherwise. The transgression of stars also make a dome shape. The North Star remains perfectly fixed in place night after night, year after year. Directly underneath the North Star Polaris sits the vortex hole into the other side of our flat plane, into the land of perpetual twilight. This is where we find Agartha, Hyperborea, the Garden of Eden. Through this opening is paradise, where war and suffering does not happen. Many of the videos on my channel are dedicated to proving this exists, with help from coded stories, allegories, and symbols that have been given to us throughout the ages. The swastika is an ancient symbol seen in almost all ancient cultures in some form, oftentimes in association with the black sun symbol. The Big Dipper dances in a circle around Polaris, and this is where the swastika symbol comes from. All compasses point to the holy hole, the true north pole of our flat plane. The reason the swastika has held such significance is because it meets at the point in which underneath lies the exit hole into paradise. The Big Dipper dancing around Polaris moves like a vortex. Underneath, there is a literal vortex. As above, so below, literally. This is the first footage ever to be seen of the polar entrance. This is a huge opening at Earth's North Pole, even though it might look small here. When we enter through this opening, we make an interdimensional flip-flop and end up in the world powered by the black sun. You can see the astral light, or aurora borealis, shooting out. It's a faint green color here. This was claimed to be taken by the Russian space station, but this is obviously taken much closer through an airplane window. The elite, among all of their control mechanisms and fear-based programming, have given us clues such as this video, the Holy Grail, the Spear of Destiny, and many others. These clues have been placed here as a form of lesser magic, hiding the truth in plain sight, so those who may decode them can get out of this false matrix and into a place full of love and unity. The other side of Flat Earth is more in sync with its fifth dimensional nature. 
There is easily accessible divine information down there, a heart-centered consciousness. We are gathering for this journey to the center under blood over intent. There is a spiritual filter in place and only those who have spilt their blood over their divine intent will be allowed in. This is white blood magic that is sealing our names with the intent to bring forth heaven on earth. This intent is divine, and when we spill a few drops of blood on it, we are then metaphysically aligned with the vibrations of this intent. Search blood over intent, replicate the videos you see, publish it on YouTube, and stay tuned. The journey to the center is happening within a few years' time. Me and my blood brethren have the right intent. We know our destination. Now is the gathering period. Blood over intent is also reshaping the fabric of this reality. We're going to the center, but in the meantime, we're doing our part in alchemically sealing this side of Flat Earth with the word spell, Heaven on Earth. So Mother Earth harnesses a gateway into another realm, what I call the vaginal vortex. Once we're through, we will be able to remain in paradise, and some of us may choose to exit this entire matrix through the black sun, which is indeed a black hole sun. The great deep that many Flat Earth depictions describe is not a place to fear. It's simply dark because it's perpetual twilight down there, illuminated by the black sun. I've said over and over again, down below is not a place of horrors and damnation. That idea has been given to us so we may never discover the fountain of youth. The scary stories of hell and the underworld, throw them out of your repertoire. We are in hell right now. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned the ancient Finnish representation of our flat plane. Within this model, a great whirl was caused by the North Pole by the rotation of a column of sky. Through this whirl, souls could go to the outside of the world to the underworld. Ancient cosmology and illustrations are riddled with mandalas and drawings that all converge toward the center. This is no coincidence. Get to the center. X marks the spot where we find the Holy Grail underneath Polaris, shining down from the center of the Flat Earth Dome. Thank you for watching, everyone. Please take care of yourselves. Keep spreading love, light, and truth. I love you all.